house which becomes a home. One hands down and another takes up the heritage of mind and heart, laughter and tears, musings and deeds. Love, like a carefully loaded ship, crosses the gulf between the generations. Therefore, we do not neglect the ceremonies of passage. When we wed, when we die, when we are blessed with a child, when we depart and when we return, when we plant and when we harvest. Let us bring up our children. It is not the place of some official to hand them their heritage. If others impart to our children our knowledge and ideals, they will lose all that is wordless and full of wonder. Let us build memories in our children, lest they allow treasures to be lost because they have not been given the keys. We live not by things, but by the meanings of things. Let us transmit the meaning from generation to generation. So I am back in the pulpit today after some time away, and I'm so pleased to be here. And I feel compelled to begin like those essays that we would write for school as kids, how I spent my summer vacation, which fits the theme because I spent my summer with a lot of kids. My own son and his friends, of course, but I also spent it with our congregation's kids when I led a mini chalice camp here at KUUF, which was a little gathering of some of the children from our congregation, aged preschool all the way up to sixth grade. And in addition to that, I also spent a week teaching middle schoolers at a family camp in Idaho. So I was hanging out with kids all summer, essentially. So first, let me tell you about family camp, because you might not know. A lot of us, when we hear the words family camp, we think of the stereotypical, cis-normative, hetero, nuclear family, two parents, mom and dad, and two kids, a boy and a girl. So family camp sounds like maybe a gathering of these sorts of families. But family camp, and let's be honest, families are so much more than that. At family camp, there are blended families and multiple generations and people who are single and found families. There are queer families and families with no kids, grandparents raising their grandkids, or middle-aged children raising kids of their own while also caring for their parents. This this is family camp. All these people together sharing meals and playing games and singing songs, living in a little intentional community together for a while. And this is the spirit which went into the creation of our own chalice camp here at KUUF. And I'll tell you why we did it. Because the families and the kids asked for it because they asked for more community. And also because my call to ministry comes out of who I am, and I'm a mom. And in summertime, I am like every parent, seeking ways to spend time with my son. And the coolest thing was that I brought my son to Chalice Camp, and Tanisha Smith, our congregational administrator, brought her kids too. Tanisha works in the office here during the week, and she manages everything for KUUF, everything, literally, yes. Tanisha, let's just send her blessings right now, wherever she is. And her awesome kids attended Chalice Camp along with my son, and it was really wonderful to be in community like this with all of our kids together. This is such a critical part of justice building that often gets overlooked. When as an organization, we affirm the humanity of our employees by making space for their lives and not forcing them to pretend that they don't have kids and families. 
when we say at a Unitarian Universalist congregation that we welcome all of you here, all of who you are, this is what we mean. You, your kids, your parents, your grandparents, your found family, everyone and everything that makes up you is welcomed into community. And at our little chalice camp, we had kids, of course, and parents too, but we also had grandparents and adults who didn't bring their kids. <laughs> and we had our cherished elders, and all of us, this community of kids and adults all ages, we ate together and sang songs and played games, and it was lovely. And I remember at one point, during our little potluck lunch, watching the eldest among us, folks in their 90s, in conversation with the youngest among us, kids who are maybe five years old, and they were talking about nothing in particular, everything and nothing, over a hot dog and a glass of juice out there in the breezeway on a beautiful, sunny summer day. This was so precious, this time together, because these spaces are more and more difficult to find. And the young people and parents in this congregation have told me directly that the thing they love the most about being a part of this congregation is the intergenerational relationships. This is one of the big reasons why young families belong to this fellowship. Because spending time in a liberal religious community of multiple generations is a precious gift and they can't find it anywhere else. And I would say that these connections, these relationships, is absolutely how we will successfully confront the evils of our world. Our families come here looking for grandparents and cousins and aunts and uncles and all those relationships and all that support. And role models, older people who are intelligent and open-minded involved in social justice and activism, who can model for us what it means to live a life of integrity, a life that nourishes the mind and the heart. We all want our cherished elders to pass this wisdom down to us, not just in words and stories, but in the everyday way that a life is lived by consistent presence and example. This is the gift that so many older folks here have to share with our young ones, with all of us. And it is incumbent on us to continue to make these opportunities happen, where we engage with one another across generational lines. And sometimes the number of children in our congregation can seem pretty small. But I would say that the small number really makes them just all the more precious. Every child deserves our attention and our energy and our investment. These are the children who will take the promise of Unitarian Universalism and build on what we give them. The world needs it and them. And we have to make sure we have gifted it to them so that it is in their bones, that they know they are inherently worthy, that they believe in justice and liberation and equality that they understand and have witnessed the power of leading with love. And of course, our children have their own gifts to share and their own lessons to teach us, lessons that we have to be present with them to receive. I have learned so much from our kids this summer. I learned the importance of staying open and flexible quite literally sometimes, during games, but also just as an approach to life, being comfortable with not knowing something, being unafraid to ask questions, trying something new. We enthusiastically played games that most of us had never heard of before, and if we didn't know the rules, we made them up as we went along. I also learned how clever and capable our kids are during a game here, one of the adults took a pretty bad spill out there in the parking lot. And while I stood over the injured adult trying to get help while simultaneously keeping the kids occupied, 
One of our brilliant children ran as fast as she could to get the parish nurse, who happened to be in the kitchen making lunch. She also happened to be this child's mom, <laughs> so that helped. But I was so impressed by this child's presence of mind and her ability to see a problem and act. And I learned how much our children love their elders and how they are aching for opportunities to show that love and respect. Each of the two days of chalice camp, we had a potluck and our congregational elders were invited. Elders are people aged 80 and over. And before they came, I explained to the kids that the elders would eat first. We have learned this from our indigenous communities as a way to show respect. And the kids were really into it. When the elders arrived, the children were pulling out chairs and asking what they could do to help and making sure that the youngest ones knew to wait. On the second day, I barely had to remind them of this practice. They were eager to do it. The laughter and the playfulness, the presence and the creativity, this is what we adults need to learn. And when it comes to confronting the evils of the world, creativity and flexibility are critical. You can see we need one another. The elders of our congregation have stories of resilience and perseverance. They are a source of strength. And they provide the web of support that allows our children to be creative, to feel confident, to try new things and dream new ways of making justice real. And in the months ahead, we will be doing some events here at KUUF to encourage these multi-generational connections. And I hope you will keep an eye out for those. Our fun and frolic committee is up and running again and it has some events planned, yes. And at our auction in November, there will be an opportunity to support children's religious education and a request that they have made for more multi-generational engagement. Because this is what our kids want and need and deserve from us, our most precious resource, which is our time, our attention, our love and enjoyment of them. And each one of us has a part in this. My friend and colleague, Reverend Teresa Soto says, all of us need all of us to make it. And I want to share with you a story about the real power of multi-generational community to make change. There is a congregation in North Carolina called Sacred Fire UU. And there was a time when Sacred Fire, the community, heard stories of a local property owner in the larger community where they lived. And this man, this property owner, owned a lot of buildings in low-income neighborhoods. And he particularly took advantage of a community of Mexican immigrants who had little ability to fight back. And the people in his homes were trying to speak to this man, to stand up to him and demand to be treated fairly, but to no avail. So they asked Sacred Fire UU to work on their behalf to get this man to fix up the places that he owned, to be fair and clear in his dealings with people. The man ignored everyone. And eventually, both groups working together decided to put together a protest. And they gathered everyone, everyone from the congregation and everyone from the Mexican-American community, and they all agreed to meet outside the home where this man lived. And so they all showed up. And when I say everyone, I mean it literally everyone, mothers and fathers and babies and grandmothers and grandfathers, children and teens, everyone. And they all stood in front of this man's house. And that was it. They all gathered together, over a hundred of them, and stood facing the front of his house. And they did this to send a message to this man, that the people he was taking advantage of were not alone. That 
this was a community, a community of people gathering together across generations, across the categories that are meant to divide us, bringing all their strengths and gifts together in that one powerful moment of witness, saying, we see you, we see what you're doing. And things shifted after that. Both communities grew stronger and more confident. They knew that they were willing to come together. They knew they had power, old and young, everyone fighting for one another. And this changed them. And eventually, they were able to get this man to court and force him to comply with the law. And that story reminds me of that famous apocryphal Emma Goldman quote, if I can't dance, I don't want to be a part of your revolution. Well, I feel that way about children and elders. If the revolution doesn't have children and elders, if I can't bring my child and my parents, it's not my revolution. May we remember how powerful we are together, that no matter how often they try to separate us, to separate the generations, to literally separate families, to separate children from parents. They do this for a reason, because together we are powerful. All of us need all of us to make it. And I want to close with a prayer inspired by that phrase, a prayer written by Teresa Soto and Megan Foley. All of us need all of us to make it. Would you say that with me? All of us need all of us to make it. In a world where some of us are targeted for struggle and brutality, where others of us benefit and flourish, we pray. All of us need all of us to make it. In a world where powerful people of ill will and indifference make us fearful for our safety and our futures, we pray. All of us need all of us to make it. On behalf of children and elders who are often separated from us and from one another, when we need one another the most, let us pray. All of us need all of us to make it. And for our larger community of Kitsap County and all of the various people and communities who call this place home, let us remember, all of us need all of us to make it. Amen and blessed be. We are not our own. We belong to one another. And we are not alone. Go forth knowing that you are held by this community, love shared across the generations, from our ancestors to babies yet to be born. May the spirit of love remain with you in the week ahead. Blessed be and amen.